guys, welcome back to KHLC Fanbase. My name is Joey, and today I'm going to be talking about, or well, I'm going to be showing you a Shannon Messenger interview. We did not actually conduct this interview. This entire thing was taking off Shannon Messenger's Instagram. She live streamed this entire thing from um, Arizona, I believe, because she was just about to do a tour. This interview was taken slightly after Legacy was released. I think this was about a day after Legacy was released. So it was actually quite a long time ago, but I just kind of forgot about it. So yeah, she asked viewers to send us some questions and she is going to answer them in this gigantic live stream. There's actually a live stream today. It probably already passed. It happened at 4.30, I think. If you guys want me to, tell me if I should record that live stream and then upload it again, just like this kind of, because it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be an interview. So if you guys want me to record that live stream, tell me in the comments and then I will definitely upload it next week. And also about this live stream, there's nothing really going on in the frames, you're just seeing Shannon Messenger talking. So if you want to put down your phone to do something else, you can totally just listen to it. So let's get straight into the live stream. Hi everybody, I am here to answer your questions. I am so excited. I am at, um, I'm in Tempe, Arizona, getting ready for my event. And I hear that you have a lot of questions for me, so I can't wait. All right, so our first question is, what inspired you to write Keeper of the Lost Cities? Ooh, good question. You know, it came from a lot of places, but my quick pitch for the series is always that it's Lord of the Rings meets X-Men, because it kind of came from my love of all things Legolas and then all things X-Men. I wanted characters that had lots of abilities, and I wanted them to be elves. We're getting a lot of I love your dress. Oh, yay! I know, I bought this just for the event. I know they're not black swans, but it's hard to find black swans, so swans it is. <laughs> All right, next question. Which alternate POV have you enjoyed writing the most? Ooh, that's tricky because you're trying to get me to answer a favorite character, which I'm not going to say. I, I actually had a lot of fun writing Tams for this new um, short story because he's just so moody and emo, and it was just kind of fun to dive into his head. But I like all of them equally. All right, and do you ever get writer's block? If so, how do you deal with it? You know, I don't like to call it writer's block because to me, calling it writer's block makes it sound like this huge thing, almost like a disease, like I got writer's block. And I prefer to just think of it as I get stuck. And yes, I do get stuck all of the time. Um, but the way that I work through it is I just kind of step away from the draft, go for a walk, I brainstorm. I try to play the what if game and I found that the more outlandish the what if, the easier I get unstuck. It'll just be like, what if an ogre king pops out of the ground right now? And it's suddenly, that's why that scene happened in Everblaze, because I was stuck and I was just like, something needs to happen. How about this? And so just kind of play around with it until you've come on it with an idea that inspires you again. Awesome. And what kind of scenes are your favorite to write? I really like writing scenes that have like snarky banter dialogue. You've probably noticed this because there's a lot of those moments between Keith and Ro. Like, I love writing dialogue, and especially when I get to just harness my inner snark is really, really fun for me. Awesome. And someone named Electric Spin says Tam is their favorite character right now. Do you have anything to say to that? I, Tam appreciates your support, and I'm glad to see that he's getting some love because I know it's usually about Keith and Fitz, so. Awesome. All right, next question. If you had an ability, what would it be and why? I would want to teleport. I hate airplanes. You probably saw me whining earlier on my stories about being on an airplane and it was a tiny little one. So if I could skip that process. And yes, I do realize that teleporting requires me to jump off a cliff. That is how much I hate airplanes. I would rather jump off a cliff and be able to teleport than have to get on an airplane. So yes, sign me up for that. Awesome. And Laura is wondering what your favorite key funny moment is. Oh boy, that's really hard because I don't want to give any spoilers, but I will say, I mean, pretty much anytime he's with Ro, um, and there is a scene in Legacy that involves elf-shaped cookies that I was seriously, like, tears were streaming down my face as I was writing that. So hopefully you guys enjoy that one when you get there. You'll know it when you see it. All right, next up, if you, oh, we already did that one. Is <laughs> it true that Keith wasn't originally supposed to exist in the series? I, I hate the word supposed because I knew that Fitz needed a friend. Like, I knew that it would be weird if, like, he only hung out with his sister's friends. That would make him a little bit of a weird character. Um, but I didn't know who that friend was. And I did not plan Keith. When I planned all the other characters, I did not have Keith in my 
arsenal and he just sort of came out of the story and I realized this is who Fitz's best friend is. So it was, he filled a hole that I knew was there, but I didn't know what I was going to put in there. Oh, awesome. All right. So let's see. Do you enjoy destroying the hearts of your readers? I, I, I start smiling. So I'm, it's going to be hard to say anything other than yes. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I will say this. I don't like when bad things happen to my characters. It breaks my heart, too. Um, but there is something to be said for the fact that, like, if you guys are feeling that same devastation, then I'm doing my job as an author, both because my job is to, you know, make the story tense and interesting, but also... You're supposed to care about the characters. So, you know, I I feel satisfied when it happens. I feel like, yeah, I did my job. But I also, you know, those same moments kill me as a writer. Like, they devastate me. So we're all suffering together, I basically, is what we're saying. We're getting more compliments on your dress. <laughs> big, big fans here. Uh, the next question here that's popping up a lot is, how do you come up with the names of your characters? For someone who doesn't have kids, I have read more baby name books and baby name websites than anybody. Um, I like the meanings to match, if at all possible. There's a few where I couldn't um, find anything, but so like Keith means good looking. It was kind of a given there. Sophie means wisdom. Fitz is from Fitzroy, which means son of the king, and he's kind of like royalty. Um, so it just kind of was all names that said something to me about the character and um, and felt also like them like just I was trying to find something that felt elfy but wasn't so weird that no one would be able to pronounce it it's kind of a long process so I, I read a lot of baby name books <laughs> wonderful and next up how many cats do you have and what are their names right now I have three um three girls it is Harley Quinn and she definitely is a little villain uh Melody Pond which if you're a Whovian you know what that reference is and then I have Gwen Stacy and she really does climb all kinds of things so she's very aptly named as well wonderful all right in what ways do you feel you and Sophie are similar well, she's a lot braver than I am. I feel the need to specify that. Um, but, I mean, we share a lot of things in common. I mean, Sophie, it, she she tends to sort of worry about things, and I am a compulsive worrier. We share the same nervous habit. Um, that's why Sophie tugs on her eyelashes, because that's what I do when I'm nervous. Um, I'm trying very hard not to do it right now. That's why I'm sitting with my hands in my lap like a nerd. Um, so we have that in common. Um, yeah, there's a few other things, but I feel like mostly I, I feel I, I see the differences between me and Sophie more than the similarities. I wish I was as smart and brave as she is. All right. So let's see. What, in your opinion, is the character who needs more appreciate, appreciation than she or he gets? <laughs> I feel like whoever asked this wants me to say Dex because I know there's like this whole Dex appreciation squad out there. Which I will say, read Legacy. There's a lot of decks in Legacy. Um, you know, it's hard for me because I feel like I oh, my goal is to always put every character into the book as much as I can. Because um, I love my characters and it's just, it's hard. There's so many of them. I, I know one character that I, re I have more that I want to do with him and I haven't been able to do it yet because the story's not quite ready for it yet is Gen C. So hopefully we get a lot more of Gen C to come. All right, we have a question. Any advice for sticking with a story plot? It sounds like we're having some folks who are getting stuck with our writing on plot points. You know, it's hard. I mean, sometimes you do need to give up on, I, on an idea. Sometimes an idea is just, it starts out really shiny and special and you start to write it and you realize this just isn't that. Um, I had a number of books that I started before Keeper that I never finished and it's probably better that I didn't. Um, so sometimes there's that if you're losing interest in it, there's nothing wrong with losing interest in it. But at the same time, you do want to try to make it your goal to finish a book. So if you're losing interest in it, it probably means that you need to change something up. You need to add something else into the story. Maybe you need another side character or maybe you need to use that side character more. So again, it kind of goes back to that what if game. Just play with it and get really creative with it and do something different and you might find that it brings some new life into your story and gets you interested in it again because usually that's what it is you've gotten bored with what you're telling a similar question that another f person asked is how do you keep track of complicated plots <laughs> not as well as i want to um, it involves a lot of keyword searches like i kind of 
naively thought that my brain would be able to remember every single thing and the plot is so complicated so it's a lot of um me having to go back through the previous books and look up what i've already said and make lots of notes to myself of like things that i haven't explained and things that i have explained and it's actually quite tedious i keep hoping there's some like magic solution that will make this process easier if anyone knows it please feel free to share but for right now it's just a lot of back checking and making notes to myself and it's kind of the drudgery a lot of times i like make notes like look up later and i just keep going with the scene and any tips on world building Ooh, world building is so much fun um i and this is going to sound like it takes the fun out of it but i say focus on the logic of it so like when you make a decision then think okay so because of a then how does that affect b c d e and f i mean it can be again a little bit tedious but you want your world to feel like it makes sense and if you're just randomly making a bunch of decisions like i want them to eat this and i want them to wear this and i want them to live here it won't feel like a believable world but if you say okay so i want them to be able to travel on beams of light so then that probably means that their buildings will need to be crystal because light is so important to them and they probably would have crystal in their jewelry and uh, and in their gadgets and they would need things to be able to travel on this beam of light then your world will start to have a harmony to it. And so that's kind of what I would do. I would make one decision and then I would follow all the ripples through. And sometimes it meant that there were things about my world that were not the way I wanted them to be, but it just made so much sense that it was like, no, that's how the world would be. And it makes your world feel more real in my opinion, at least. A uh, big thank you to a couple of folks who are saying that they're coming to tonight's event. We can't Yay! wait to see you. Yay. All right. Then we also have some folks who are really, really excited for nerddoms and fandoms. <laughs> so for all those folks, what are your favorite different nerddoms and fandoms and why? Well, I think everybody knows I'm a Whovian given by my cat name. Um, I also love Harry Potter. Um, I still love Sherlock, although it's kind of faded away, but pretty much anything with Benedict Cumberbatch, I will always love. Um, and honestly, I don't have the like current things. I haven't had time to watch them. I've been writing 800 page books for you. So feel free to leave me suggestions on things to watch because I would very much like to catch up on all the amazing things that I've missed these last couple years. All right. So now we're going to go into some lightning rounds okay. and then we might switch back to other questions. Okay. So lightning round, what is your favorite Elven delicacy and why? Well, I imagine it would be custard bursts because there's no recipe for it, but the, I wrote those as like, that's what I wish existed in the world. And no, there's no recipe for them yet because I've never been able to find a way to make anything that tastes like it. <laughs> will there be a ninth book? There will. Yeah. When we announced the deal for book eight, we announced that there would be a book nine. And for those who've actually finished Legacy and seen that, yes, this is not a spoiler. There is a cliffhanger. You should know this by now. So don't worry. There will be a book nine. You will get more information. I'm not ending the series there. That would be a terrible ending point for the series. And I think I speak for everybody when I say, will you ever tell us who Sophie's parents are? <laughs> Well, I don't want to give spoilers, but I will just say read Legacy. <laughs> All right. Next up, will we see more of Dex and Stina in Legacy? You will. Um, I, I, I won't say more than that, but you will. Um, they, I feel like they're in it a lot. So enjoy. Awesome. And another question here, kind of cutting out of the lightning round, is why all the cliffhangers? <laughs> It's not because I'm trying to be evil, I swear. It's just this this story is not an episodic story, and yet I have to break it into books because otherwise it would be, you know, a 7,000-page book and you guys would have to wait forever for me to have it. So I just kind of have to pick a stopping point, and it means there's going to be a cliffhanger. I, I try to wait for what I feel like is a game-changer, and so it, I try to wait for a moment where it's like, okay, now this is spiraling the plot in a completely new direction. So that's why we're stopping here. But there's no way to wrap it up because we're in the middle of this huge thing. So I'm not trying to torture you guys, I promise. Although I do realize that I am. It's just this is not an episodic story. And it's just something that I have to break it up at some point. Otherwise, you'd never get the next book. All right. And will Iggy ever become his regular color again? That's up to you guys, because I don't get to pick Iggy's colors. So um, I, it gets put to a vote. Usually Simon & Schuster, my publisher, my amazing publisher, 
um, is the one that helps figure out what options to give you. So it's possible they may have it be go back to original gray as one of those options, and then it would be up to you guys to vote for it, because that is something that's completely out of my hands. Once you guys pick the color, then I figure out how to write that change into the book, um, and you guys get control over it. This is a really funny one, um, which I'm now just curious about. Do you like pineapple pizza? <laughs> um, it's not my favorite. Although I love pineapple fried rice, but eh, pineapple pizza, I'll eat it because it's pizza, but I'd probably never order it. All right. And similar kind of in that vein is what is your favorite food? Tacos. But I should specify, I kind of have to be somewhere really close to Mexico to get good tacos like you know California I'm from Southern California I live in Southern California we have amazing tacos and when I go to other places that are much further away from Mexico and get what they call a taco um, the taco snob in me is is not impressed for the most part <laughs> so good good authentic Mexican tacos yes all right and what is your favorite color Oh boy, this is going to make it seem like I'm on a team. This is actually just something of mine that I gave to Sophie. Sophie's favorite color is the same as mine. I love teal. I don't love it because there's a beautiful teal-eyed boy in my life. Um, I just love it because I think it's a pretty color. <laughs> All right, let's see. Ooh, we're getting some fun questions in. So I think a really common theme here is, is there any characters that were inspired by someone in real life? I know that people wish that there were, um, especially because they're hoping I'll say that they're like, really is a Keefe and really is a Fitz out there in the world somewhere. No, my characters, I don't really know where they come from, but they are definitely not based on people that I know. They're figments of my imagination and they kind of come with their own personalities. And I feel like I just sort of dig into their backstory to get to know them because I'm a big believer that we are the... It's, our, our experiences are what make us who we are. And so for me, I just kind of think about what have they been through before they come into the story, what things have happened to them, and then that kind of shapes them. And it's really, I, I intentionally try not to model them off of people I know because then I would feel like my hands are tied trying to stay authentic to that person. Plus, you know, sometimes I have to let bad things happen to my um, characters and then my friends would be really mad at me if I let something bad happen to the character I based off of them. So it's just kind of better to let them be their own separate thing. Oh, and here's another fun one. Um, for the covers, what is your favorite thing about the new cover? I love how strong Sophie looks on this cover. Like, I, and I love her outfit, but I'm, I just love that we get to see her using her powers and that she just looks so fierce and you know and it's just every year it's so fun to watch it's like my little girl is growing up on the covers and she just it looks so grown up and it's like tear <gasps> author mommy moment <laughs> so we've had a couple questions here about the writing process and kind of how revisions work and publishing uh could you tell us a little bit about that well, I'm on a really weird schedule because I'm trying to keep up with such long, long, long books. So usually for me now, what I do is I do a lot of brainstorming back and forth with my editor, um, usually in the form of very long emails so that I have a record of what we're talking about. And we kind of suss out like the major plot points that way. And then I dive in and because they're such long books, I give her the book in chunks as I go so that we can sort of make sure I'm not veering off course because my schedule is so tight we don't have time for it to be that I have veered off course and then we have to rewrite like a huge chunk of it there's just no way to do that so usually the best advice especially when you're a newer writer is finish the book and then revise because you can't really revise until you have the whole thing but when you're writing an 800 page book on a deadline schedule, that's just kind of not possible. So it's more like we, we do as much as we can to figure out what the book is gonna be before I start. And then it's just checking to make sure that as the story grows and evolves and changes, that those changes are good things for the story and that I'm not veering off into a weird direction. And so I edit as I go. And especially when I get, as I get toward the end, I'm editing sometimes chapter by chapter. Um, so it, it hurts my brain, but my editor and I have found a way to make it work. And she is amazing, I should say. Not every editor would go with that kind of schedule. My editor is my hero, and you guys should be thanking her. If she didn't lose as much sleep as she does for me, like this book wouldn't be out. So she is amazing. Yay, Lisa Abrams. She is 
super editor. She really is. <laughs> All right. So then another question here that we're getting is pronunciation for the different characters' names. Okay. Uh, are there any that are commonly mispronounced that you would like to kind of set the record straight? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I mean, I firmly believe that one of the magics of reading is that you get to decide these things. So I tend to not put like pronunciation guides on my website or anything because I feel like usually when a reader asks me that at an event and I say the pronunciation, they're usually either like triumphant because they were right, but then their friend is sad that they were wrong or they're sad. And so I always say like, if you want to hear it a certain way, by all means, hear it that way. Um, the one that surprises me is I thought Keith's name was kind of just everyone would read it the same way. But I guess there's quite a large population of readers that pronounce it Keefy. Um, and there is nothing wrong with that. If you prefer to hear it as Keefy, by all means. But I hear Keefe. And so it's up to you guys. But if you want to know what I hear in my head, only one syllable, it's Keefe. <laughs> and how did you come up with this series name? The series name was actually um, my agent's daughter. Um, I had, I mean, it became from the title of the first book, but the title of, of that book was chosen by my agent's daughter, who at the time I think was 12 or 13. Um, I had given the book a different title, and Simon & Schuster had rightfully said that's not a very good title. And so we had dropped it, and then I had sent them lots of long lists, which they had read and said, wow, those aren't very good titles either. I'm really bad at titles. And so I finally sent my agent like a desperate email, like, I don't what to do they hate all my titles and so she said she would brainstorm and she decided hey this is a book for 12 to 13 year olds my daughter is that age let's see what she says and her and her friend had had a sleepover and so they spent the morning brainstorming and they came up with keeper of the lost cities and we sent it to simon schuster and they said we love it and so i guess maybe for something for kids we should actually ask kids possibly might be a good idea sort of lesson learned <laughs> how do you come up with sophie's powers you know, I, I, I struggle with that because I, I, I really am trying hard to avoid like Superman syndrome where she becomes so powerful that it's just sort of like there's no tension there at all. It's like nothing can stop her. She's indestructible. So I was very specific when I chose her abilities because I wanted to make sure that she was special. She was powerful. She was Project Moonlark and she did feel like something unique to her world. But I also wanted to make sure that I wasn't making her so indestructible um, because I wanted it to be that she needs other people to help her. She needs other friends with other abilities that can add to it. Um, and so I was very, very specific about what I thought would be best. And I can't really say more than that without sort of giving away grand plans and things, but it just felt like these are the abilities that will make her both powerful and also need help. So. All right. And as for reading and writing, was there any books in particular that made you a lifelong reader or made you really want to start writing? You know, um, growing up, I loved the Ramona books um, and those were huge for me. Obviously, Harry Potter. I mean, it, it goes without saying almost and anything by Rick Riordan. Um, but a, a big game changer for me was actually Ella Enchanted. That was the first book that I read as a grown up that was for kids. And I read it specifically because at that point in time, I was starting to think, you know, maybe the reason I keep losing interest in these stories that I was trying to write for adults was because I'd, I'd rather write for a younger audience. And then I just kind of thought, well, I should probably read a young book again. It's been a really long time. And I'm, I'll admit, I was, I was kind of one of those snobby adults that picked up the book expecting that it would feel simple because it was for kids. And I read it and I was just like, this is such a brilliant reimagining of, of uh, Cinderella, which was a story that I have always loved. And she made Cinderella so much stronger and it was just such a great thing. And it, it just showed me, no, writing for kids isn't about simplifying anything or, or anything like that. It's just about writing authentic kid characters. It's I'm not writing for kids, I'm writing about kids. Um, and so that was, and I was just like, yep, this is the kind of book that I want to write. And I wanted to write for kids because that was when reading was the most special to me. I mean, I still love to read. I read all the time, but as an adult, because we're so busy, it's like I read something and then it goes on my shelf. Even if I love it, I'm probably never going to read it again because I don't have time. And, um, when I was a kid, if there was something I loved, I read it over and over and over again. And it was just all I would think about. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to try to put passion into my work, I should probably write to that version of myself and not to this adult that 
even something that she loves, she's not that passionate about it. And so that was kind of why I wanted to write for that younger demographic and Ellen Chanted sealed it for me. All right, and another one that's come up a couple times here is which Hogwarts house are you and why? I'm a Ravenclaw, um, and I guess it's because I'm kind of studious. I'm not sure, but that, according to Pottermore, and everyone who knows me seems to agree, I'm a Ravenclaw, and my Patronus is an otter, which I, I approve of. Wonderful. All right. Well, it looks like we're wrapping it up. So uh, if you want to say goodbye, that sounds lovely. Thank you guys so much for paying attention to me during this live chat. I hope my answers made sense. I feel like words have come out of my mouth and I don't know what any of them were. So thank you for listening. And thank you guys so much for all of the support. Like this series just keeps growing and growing and it's growing because of you guys. So thank you so much for reading my books, for talking about my books, for suffering through my cliffhangers and I promise I will be hard at work on book nine as soon as I'm done with this tour and I can't wait to meet some of you on the road. Entire interview. So that was the entire interview. It was pretty long and I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you made it to the end of this video, thank you so much first of all. And again, if you want me to record the live stream that went on today and then upload it just in a very, very similar fashion like this and upload it next week, next Wednesday, I will definitely do that. Just let me know. So if you enjoyed, definitely leave a like and subscribe and comment down below what was your favorite question and answer from this live stream. That's going to wrap up this video, and I'll see you guys in the next one. I hope you guys enjoyed. Bye!